Well, hello everyone. Thanks for joining us this evening. Uh, we're gonna get started in just a minute. So if you all would please mute yourself and stop your video, we can get our PowerPoint going and Evelyn can uh, start this great tour for all of you. Uh, the only thing I want to say as we start is that we had a great uh, in-person tour. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen and we're going to have a little uh, video from that tour, a little welcome for everybody. So let me do my thing. There we go. Uh, let me see which one I'm supposed to do. I think I pressed this and that. No, nope, that doesn't look right, does it? Yeah, does everybody see uh, the tour of LGBTQ Rochester? Yeah, yes. that's good. Okay, that's a good start. Uh, let me pull up my part. So there, that's now I'm all set. And uh, thanks for being here. And here's our little video for all of you to enjoy. Hello, everyone. Here we are at Sue Cowell's house for our first uh, in-person tour in a long time. Uh, we want to just say hello to everyone in the virtual tour. So I'm Larry Franzer with the Landmark Society. Carol Lippersol Weiss, HRC Western and Central New York. Paul Allen representing Image Out. Evelyn Bailey with Shoulders to Stand On and Yard Alliance. And we all want to thank Evelyn for all her hard work and thank you for being there and thank everyone for being here today. So uh, enjoy, enjoy. We'll enjoy today. You'll enjoy then. Thank you. <laughs> okay. You got a little taste of our tour. And the one thing I want to say was that it was so, it was so exciting for me to uh, have that group and to be together and the energy of being on an in-person tour was just great. But a real treat was to have Karen Hagberg with us on the tour. And you'll hear, hear more about Karen, but it was great to have her and get a chance to talk with her. It was the first time I was actually meeting her. So uh, take it away, Evelyn. Here we go. Okay. Before we begin this, I need to acknowledge that the absence in verbal or written form of the contributions of our Black, Brown, Trans, non-binary and GNC sisters in the liberation movement is absent. From my personal knowledge, I know they were present in the community and active in the liberation movement and were not only active, but present at meetings. But to what degree, I do not know, and that has not been recorded anywhere. This tour is in celebration of the 50th anniversary of the Empty Closet. And it begins at the October 1971 issue, which as you can read, is the issue of the Empty Closet lovingly brought to you by the women of the U of I Gay Liberation Front. Insights into women have been few. Insights into gay women almost negligible. It is to the ever increasing activity and reflections of gay women that this issue is dedicated. And we begin this tour in a sense, at the beginning, Rochester and the Finger Lakes region are the birthplace of the modern women's rights movement and its history. There's no place better than Rochester, New York and the Finger Lakes area to start following the path 
of women who dedicated their lives to making a difference for the future. Women in Rochester fought for rights now taken for granted by women all across America. The right to vote, to own property, to work and thrive in any profession, they changed the life of every woman in America forever. Beginning with the clan mothers, the route to women's freedom and success begins centuries ago with the Seneca mothers of the Haudenosaunee, the Iroquois Confederacy, who, whose tribe occupied the Rochester region. The women who owned property, household property, as well as any tilled field, their children derived their clan membership and tribal identification through their mothers. And it was the women's duty to main, nominate male candidates for the position of chieftain. By 1848, inspired by the Seneca's matriarchal society, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Jane Hunt, Mary Ann McKintock, Lucretia Mott, and Martha Wright drew up their declaration of sentiments that began, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal. They organized the first women's rights convention in Seneca Falls. Soon afterward, another women's rights convention was held in Rochester. A major new movement was born. Two very strong, but very different women. Elizabeth Cady Stanton from Seneca Falls and Susan B. Anthony in Rochester came to lead the movement over many years. According to the acclaimed filmmaker, Ken Burns, whose documentary, Not For Ourselves Alone, the story of Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony first aired in November, 1999. He said, these two women created a movement that literally transformed American society by winning for women advances in everything from education to divorce law and the right to own property. They are, in my opinion, the two most important women in American history. In the area of higher education, the University of Rochester is home to the Susan B. Anthony Center for Women's Leadership. The center's name is a tribute to the well-known suffragist who is instrumental in getting the first female student accepted to this institution of higher learning. Due to media erasure of women's history, people are not aware of the role Rochester women played in the national wave of feminist activism and women's liberation in the 70s and early 80s. Rochester LGBTQ women's history has been underdocumented by design, omission, or bias. Women's activism continues today as the underlying backbone to the success of the women's movement, the gay liberation movement, and other social and political reform movements of the 19th and early 20th centuries. We begin the tour with a face some of you may recognize, Karen Hagbird at the University of Rochester that the documented, undocumented Rochester LGBTQ women's history began on October 3rd, 1970. Karen was one of the first women pioneers to emerge early in the Gay Liberation Front movement. Karen began the Speakers Bureau in 1970. And that first speaking engagement was held at Dr. Professor Vincent Nolis's home 
instead of on the university campus because it was the first speakers bureau engagement with students and with some professors. And Dr. Professor Nolis was concerned the university might attempt to interfere with that activity. She and her partner, Karen and her partner attended the U of R and lived on Rutgers Street where many of Karen's Speakers Bureau presentations were written and perhaps practiced. For Karen, 126 Rutgers Street was a safe haven to think, write, express, and share her thoughts on gay liberation, homosexuality, and feminism. And now we have some historical comments about this house at 126 Rutgers Street. So this house is actually located in the National Register listed Park Avenue Historic District. Um, in that listing, it gives a nice description of the building. Um, it is a shingle style building built in 1889. You're gonna see a lot of houses in this neighborhood around the Park Avenue area that look similar to this one. A lot of colonial revival was being constructed in this neighborhood during that time. I just wanna point out some notable features on it, um, such as how the second story is mm. overhanging from the first. You see a nice cornice line along the pediment, um, brackets at the eaves, and you're gonna see if you could zoom in somehow magically, which we can't, um, <laughs> you would see a really nice ornately carved um, just panel right there in the center of the house. Uh, it's still there today. Um, unfortunately today, if you, if you went by, you wouldn't see that second story porch off to the left there. The current owner is actually uh, restoring portions of the home currently. We did have a nice moment on our tour, uh, the in-person tour where the homeowner actually got to come out and meet Karen. So that was a really cool um, moment where the owner back then got to meet the current owner. Um, but yeah, so it is a really cool house. Um, one of the only in the area that does have that really nice central carved kind of uh, engraving up in the center of the house. So it is a really nice house. So we move on to Patty Evans. In 1971, Patty Evans, also an original member of the GLF and the Speakers Bureau, who was present at the Stonewall riots, began Grow, Gay Revolution of Women, the GLF Women's Organization which held its meeting at the Women's Center, originally at 555 West Main Street, and later moved to 185 East Avenue. On May 30th, 1971, Grow called for a meeting on rape at the Women's Center, which led to the founding of the Rape Crisis Center, Planned Parenthood, and the Women's Health Collective. In 1973, when the Gay Liberation Front left the U of R campus, Grow, after being threatened with a lawsuit by Greater Rochester Older Workers, who used the same an acronym, they moved, the, they renamed themselves the Lesbian Resource Center and resided at 713 Monroe Avenue. LRC became an affiliate group that functioned under the auspices of the then Gay Alliance of the Genesee Valley. LRC was an active and identifiable service group that acted as a support group, creating an atmosphere of understanding, support and community for women in various stages of adjustment and acceptance of their lifestyle, who may be experiencing feelings of frustration, isolation and discrimination as a, result, as a direct result of their chosen sexual preference. And this is an old building. Brian's gonna tell you a little more about it. Yeah, it is an old building. So the original building would have just been the portion on the right. You can see how it has that kind of arched doorway in the front. It was originally built probably in the 1890s as a firehouse. That's when we see it first showing up in the Sanborn maps. 
the neighborhood across the street was not very inhabited at the time this was constructed. There were houses here and there, but by 1900, um, the neighborhood across the street did expand quite a bit. There was a building boom in this neighborhood. So they did expand this firehouse as well. So the half to the left is actually constructed around 1900 or in between 1900 and 1910. Um, and you can notice kind of a color difference between them. They're built essentially to look exactly alike, but are actually two separate buildings. Um, one is actually kind of offset from the other a little bit. And some good notable features of this do include those really nice porthole windows up top. Those red circles are small windows. Um, and you can also see a lot of decorative molded brickwork on this building and the original firehouse hinges. Um, the hinges for the doors that were located there are there. And Evelyn and Larry were talking about a bit before the second floor does still retain many of the original firehouse features like the pole that the volunteers would have slid down to to get down to the fire truck. So it is cool and it has been determined eligible for listing on the National Register. It just has not been listed yet. A Rochester feminist entity that arose in 1975 was the newspaper called the New Women's Times. The paper was named after the New York Times which tended to ignore women's issues at that period. Maxine Sobel started the New Women's Times while she was a student at SUNY Geneseo. She moved to Rochester after graduation and the New Women's Times paper moved with her. It gradually got larger and more women joined the editorial collective. It was published monthly for the enjoyment and betterment of womankind by the New Women's Times, Inc. Post Office Box 1471, Rochester, New York, 14603. Max and her partner, Karen Caviglia, published the paper from their apartment, as was The Empty Closets, first published from an apartment. Then it was moved to a building on Monroe Avenue in Brighton before ending up at 804 Meg Street. The all-volunteer New Women's Times was a newspaper written for women by women. It dealt with women's health relationships, sexual preferences, attitudes, and practices, and violence against women in written form, television programming, and films. And this is the building at 804 Meg Street. And mm -hmm. Ryan's going to tell you about it. So this is a small commercial mixed use building constructed probably around 1915. Um, it does have a really nice decorative bracketed cornice up there. That's a different material than what the rest of the building is constructed out of. So it is a good like popping out feature. Um, and you can see that the cornice line does feature a nice parapet and raised arched portion, um, not similar to too many buildings in that neighborhood. The first story is unfortunately quite a bit altered. Um, you don't see the original corner storefront anymore that most likely would have been at this location. It is a more modern storefront off to the left. Um, uh, you can notice, you can't really see it in this picture, but there's a cool kind of inset arched entryway facing mm. the other street off onto the left side. And there's all, all these really nice white diamond features on the center of the building, um, kind of adding a nice decorative commercial building to a mostly residential portion of that neighborhood. During the 1970s, women began establishing institutions like Rochester's Rape Crisis and Alternatives for Battered Women. Until then, society had provided shelters for lost dogs, but nothing for victimized women. In the mid 70s, Rochester Women Against Violence Against Women organized Take Back the Night Marches and analyzed male control of women through violence with emphasis on the objectification of women and violence against women in porn, entertainment, art, and advertising. On October 27, 1977, the film Snuff categorized as a horror movie, opened at the Holiday Inn Cine at 120 East Main Street. Snuff was a snow called 
snuff movie involving the exploits of a cult leader leading a gang of bikers in a series of supposedly real killings on film. Women were killed. Women were cut up and thrown in garbage bags and buried in that film. On Sunday, October 30th, four women were arrested and charged with third degree criminal mischief, a felony for breaking the theater's display case glass, removing and destroying the snuff billboard, chaining the shut the entrance to the theater and spray painting Holiday Inn hates women across a glass door. Film closed prematurely after a thousand signature petition caused the owner of the Holiday Inn Hotel to demand this of the person leasing the theater. And although there's an unfortunate story behind it, I do love this building. Um, this is a really nice example of a mid-century modern uh, downtown hotel building constructed in Rochester. Originally had about 460 rooms. So it was a pretty massive venture for this area. Um, notable features include the nice pink color, the sleek modern mid-century design to it um, with large full wall windows. Unfortunately, this building is scheduled or at least last I checked was scheduled to be demolished um, for construction of another building. Um, but a fun fact about it is in the early 1970s, hotels were convinced that starting up automated cinemas within their within or within adjoining facilities was a good idea. So the Holiday Inn opened in downtown Rochester during urban renewal. They decided why not put a cinema in there. Um, they decided in a concept called Streets of Stores. So there was going to be several retail establishments as well as the cinema. Um, but that cinema did fail at some point and, and the hotel is now closed. December 9, 1977, a benefit for the Legal Defense Fund, which was, um, they, people were entertained by Andrea Dworkin, who is the speaker. The Rochester Women Against Violence Against Women was sponsoring it to support the four women who were arrested. The original trial was set for May 22, 1978. The trial was rescheduled after judge after the judge disqualified himself because he knew one of the defendant's families. Eleven months after arrest, the women pled guilty to a misdemeanor. There was going to be no opportunity to litigate relevant issues. It was to be an open and shut case concerning a broken window. The case ended with a conditional discharge with the women having been ordered to pay $100 restitution. The snuff protests raised the level of awareness about the violence perpetrated and executed against women. The empty closet and the new women's times kept the issue of violence in the forefront of the community's mind. The Rochester Women Against Violence Against Women membership grew as more women became activists in protesting the violence women experienced. In 1977, Sue Cowell, a lesbian activist, moved to Rochester to accept a position with the Health Service Division of the University of Rochester. She immediately contacted the Gay Alliance of the Genesee Valley. Within two years, Sue was heavily involved in Rochester's LGBTQ community. Sue's house on the corner of Wilmer and Harper Streets was a hotbed of political, social, cultural, and medical activism. In 1978, Sue, along with Patty Evans and others, organized the Rally for Rights in Rochester in opposition to Anita Bryant's Save the Children campaign against homosexuals teaching in schools. This began Sue's long 
political activist career. And Sue's house that you're seeing there was constructed around the year 1900. We're not sure on an exact date. And it, as well as one you saw previously, is listed within the Park Avenue Historic District. Uh, this is a modest colonial revival duplex. By modest, I just mean it's of a simple design, but that doesn't mean it doesn't stand out in the neighborhood because unlike the stone and formed concrete foundations found on most of the surrounding houses, this one does have a, a very clean uh, brick foundation. It includes clapboard siding. It does have a new asphalt roof um, and you can see a, a nice cornice within the pediment. So there's cool features on this house as well. Um, and it does include a full width open front porch with very simple turned balusters. And, and another feature that kind of stands out is the hipped roof form of these porches that you're seeing on this building. Uh, again, unlike others in the neighborhood. So it does stand out in this area. Late in 1981, Sue Cowell called a few prominent members of the Rochester Gay community to a meeting on her front porch to talk about GRID, gay related immune deficiency. I don't know which porch in the previous picture photograph that meeting took place on. Today, HIV AIDS, and actually the name has changed to be simply HIV. This was, this meeting began framing the Rochester community's response to the AIDS crisis. This list of Sue Cowell's achievements and accomplishments in AIDS reflects only one fourth of her overall cultural, political, and activist engagements. An amazing woman and thank God Rochester had her. One of the places that Sue frequented and softball groups from the city, women's softball teams frequented was the Riverview. During the 60s and 70s, bars were the only places gay men and women could gather to socialize. The Riverview, fondly referred to as the Riv, by Rochester lesbians was a bar restaurant owned by Lou and Joe on South Avenue. It was the hub of the lesbian bar culture in the 70s and into the 80s. There was only one Riverview and one Lou. The Riverview was a home away from home, a place to relax and socialize with other lesbians a daily or weekly respite from the straight world in a general safe house for lesbians. During the post Stonewall era of the second wave of feminism and gay liberation, the Riverview was a place for political organizing and a rendezvous point following dangerous political actions in the public realm. It also served as a meeting place for members of Women Against Violence Against Women. Another we're, just gonna, uh, we're just going to go back for a second so Ryan can tell us a little bit about the architecture of uh, the RIV. If you want. <laughs> <laughs> so many of you might recognize this as what's known as sidebar today at 242 South Ave. It's a very simple, modest commercial building constructed of brick and stone. You can't really tell, but there are stone lintels underneath that dark paint there. Um, and it does have a really beautiful Italianate cornice line up top. Today, unlike the raw brick and stone you would have seen back in the 1970s, um, you now look at an entirely painted building. Um, however, not much else has changed. I did see a picture of it in the 1970s and essentially is exactly the same as you would have seen back then. And behind, go back, Larry. Behind the front there, there's, there was a huge backyard that people gathered in that had tables and you, um, an outside bar. And it was, it was the place you went if you were a lesbian here in the city in the 70s and 80s. Men were not really allowed in the Riverview. Um, Dan Myers was accompanied to the Riverview 
by Sue one evening and they opened the door and a beer bottle was flung and hit the door above Dan's head. He left and did not return. <laughs> Another bar in Rochester that came into existence in 1979 was at 219 Monroe Avenue, Rosie's. The owners, Vicki Fumia and Maureen Boyle, described Rosie's as a safe, friendly, fun place for Rochester lesbians. Vicki bought the building and before Rosie's opened in August of 1979, the building housed an antique shop. Then Vicki and Maureen thought it would be fun to have a bar. So out went the antique shop and in came Rosie's truck stop baths, bar, and disco. That is Rosie's legal name. According to Maureen, Rosie's uniqueness was in not having mirrors on the dance floor. In the early 80s, Rosie's was the home of the hybrid motorcycle club, a leather Levi club, which was the first club in Rochester to win first place awards at various inter-club events nationally and internationally. A mural of a woman was painted on the side of the building resembling Vicky's partner at the time, smoking a cigarette with a red rose resting against her right shoulder. According to Vicky, Rosie's had the best lights, music, and drinks. Everyone had a good time, felt safe and comfortable without pressure to get drunk. In 1991, owning a bar was no longer fun. So Maureen and Vicky closed Rosie's and shortly thereafter, the bug jar opened. And I'm now, so, I'm sorry. Building history. <laughs> building this description. Building, <laughs> this building is certainly old. Um, the exact date, not really sure, but visually and according to maps could be about 1885. Um, and this is a commercial building with much like the others, uh, an Italianate style bracketed cornice, simple stone lintels above the windows. The storefronts have been altered over time, but are probably similar to what would have been seen during the day Rosie's was there. Um, and the building has also been determined eligible for listing on the National Register of Historic Places. In 1979, this was a, certainly a year for the coming to life of women's space dedicated to sharing lesbian culture and history. Christine Galvin, a Rochester lesbian entrepreneur, opened Snake Sisters Cafe, a lesbian bar and restaurant at 666 South Avenue in 1979 now known as Lux. Women worked on redesigning the space and doing the reconstruction. And my understanding is that Susan Plunkett was a part of that. And the history of 666 South Avenue, I leave to Ryan. Well, this building is located within the South Wedge National Register Historic District. It's a two story, Italianate commercial buildings, a little smaller than the ones we've looked at. It was constructed most likely around 1870. It now has more of a modern storefront, um, kind of stone facade you can see there on the bottom level. Notable features include the Italianate style brick window hoods. They do include keystones you can see up top and a patterned brickwork up at the cornice. Despite alterations to the original storefront, the building retains its characteristic scale and massing and second story detailing up top. So this building has been determined by SHPO to be eligible for listing on the National Register of Historic Places individually, but it is, like I said, within a district. Snake Sisters Cafe became the lesbian cultural center for music, comedy, poetry readings, and plays, including Holly Nia, Robin Taylor, Meg Christian, and a hotbed of political feminist activity such as sewing slides of West Valley 
nuclear waste storage facility, raising money to subsidize buses to New York City for the October 20th, 1979 March Against Pornography. Also, Loyal GBTQ Women's History in Rochester took a giant step forward for women's equality with the action of the top free seven at Cobbs Hill Park on June 21st, 1986. Ramona Santarelli and six women were not arrested, but issued appearance tickets for their violation of the law that allows men, but not women, to go to topless in public. On Monday, September 15, 1986, Ramona appeared in court to respond to charges brought against her and the other six women who participated in the Top Free Seven action in June. Rochester City Court Judge Herman Walds gave attorneys until November 3rd to file additional legal briefs and arguments and won't reach a decision until then. The women said they were pleased with the four day trial in which they contended the state law that permits men but not women to appear in public naked from the waist up is sexist, discriminatory and unconstitutional. The women were each charged with exposure of a person, a violation that is punishable by up to 15 days in jail and a $250 fine. On appeal, two of the women's charges were reversed by the New York State Court of Appeals in 1992 on equal protection grounds in Santorelli's case. In July of 1992, charges against Rochester's top free seven were dismissed by the State Court of Appeals. The judges said that including women's breasts under private or intimate parts of her body created a clear gender-based classification. And so the case was dismissed. The tour or this part of women's history tour will end at Wild Steeds Bookstore and Cafe at 704 University Avenue, where Edibles Restaurant is today. Marge Booker and her partner, Lori Matoka, had a grand opening for Wild Seeds on Sunday, October 30th, 1988. Marge and Lori were open to a wide selection of books, magazines, music, and events that had feminist, multicultural, lesbian, and gay, progressive political health, addiction, and, recovering, and recovery themes. In effect, Marge and Lori created a community center where kids, parents, men and women, gay and straight, were all welcome. The electric, the electric infusion of many presentations, readings, musical experiences and dialogues created an openness that brought people together from every walk of life. Open from 10 a.m to 7 p.m. Tuesday through Saturday, and from noon to 5 p.m. on Sundays, allowed for working people, retirees, school children with or without parents to spend time at Wild Seeds, borrowing and absorbing the non-threatening safe environment that filled the space. This building is a good example of a typical 19th century commercial building combining predominant use of brick along with decorative use of cast iron elements. So we're actually seeing metal being used as decorative elements on this building. Um, you can't really see here, but there is an ornate parapet up along the top and they're really nice. Um, you can kind of see it off to the left here on this picture, really nice cast iron window base on this building as well. On the evening of July 18th, 1992, the Rochester community said, Thank you to Wild Seeds with the Women's Music Festival that was a homecoming reunion for many performers who had performed 
and appeared at the cafe over the previous three years and a chance for them and Wild Seed fans to show how they felt about, about Marge and Lori and what they had created. It was a special, funny and magical evening. For four years, the Rochester community experienced Wild Seeds, a place where everyone could grow, learn and flourish wildly. One can only hope that the seeds, Marge, Lori, and the Wild Seeds store itself planted in the hearts, minds, and souls of all who were part of the Wild Seeds experience will be a fruit in creating a more welcoming, inclusive, and open Rochester community. The sixth historic walking tour presented a very brief history of Rochester's LGBTQ women's history. This small window has shared some of the unknown and undocumented contributions that Rochester LGBTQ women have made to the women's movement and the liberation movement. There is much more and you can find it in the Empty Closet newspaper online and you can find it in the New Women's Times online. So I turn it back to Larry and say thank you to everyone who has attended. Well, we have to say thank you to Evelyn. So if everybody wants to uh, put their video back on and you can turn your mute off, uh, we can uh, give a round of applause for Evelyn and the great job she did. Thank you. Thank you so much, Evelyn. You do so much for this community and we all really appreciate it. Yay. Yay, Yay, it's really well right. done. Wow. <laughs> Thanks. Wow. So it's it's great to have some of the women who were part of uh, a lot of these uh, adventures and political action. So uh, I, I just love to hear a little bit from uh, from some of you. Before that, though, I do want to say Thank you from the Landmark Society, as well as all of our other partners. Uh, if you go on the Landmark Society website, uh, you can click on LGBTQ initiative and you can see more about it. You can see all six of, well, five, we haven't put the sixth one on, but all the other five walking tours that we did uh, you can see those brochures. You can also see a video of uh, the last virtual tour that we did. And this one will be on there soon. So remember that as we're talking now, you're going to be caught for eternity. Uh, say, say wonderful things because uh, I'm sure it was a great time to be in Rochester. Are there any questions or comments? Or yeah, we'd love to hear from you. I wondered uh, if you know, um, you did a great job of architecturally describing things. Very interesting about that, um, but maybe I missed it. What year was the Riverview building and um, what year did the Riverview start and end? Does anybody know that? And what is it now? Looks better now than it ever did, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think you began during the 1960s and 60s. Yeah, during the 1960s and it closed in the 80s. Um, I did some research um, on the Riverview uh, a number of months ago actually. And um, Christine Galvin, um, apparently was involved in the Riverview as well. Because at one point after Lou and had died, she got the Riverview and then she transferred ownership to her mother. And then her mother transferred ownership back to her. And then it was sold to
to the current uh, owners of the sidebar. Right. So uh, it's now called the sidebar. It is. It is a bar. Again. Right. Still a bar. Oh my god. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> yeah. I remember when we worked on it, we painted it at the time. I forget what colors now, but it really looks good. It looks better than it did. So, but I don't remember it ever serving food. That's the only thing that I'm not sure that was right. I never had a rest. I never saw a restaurant there when I went there. And I'm sorry. I never remember them serving food or it being a restaurant. Um, no, I don't think they did. I don't um, Okay. It wasn't at that time a restaurant. It was primarily rooms with tables. Yes. To drink at. It was and two that, rooms and a tiny bathroom. <laughs> it wasn't very big. It wasn't very big, even though a lot of people were in there. Yeah. Oh, and you said it, you said it had like a uh, a patio area. It had yeah, it did. Uh, which yeah. reminds me of uh, Snake Sisters or Lux, because they've got that area in the back there as well. Did they always use it when it was Snake Sisters? Oh, yeah. I don't remember that. Well, Snake Sisters had a restaurant. Yeah. It was uh -huh. a, a restaurant. Cool. And yeah. Susan Plunkett was involved in that. I forget whether she was one of the owners, but I do remember her having a restaurant there. That was her food. <laughs> it was her food, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I have one. That was a great picture, of Ramona. Oh my God! And um, I remember Ramona. I remember the 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 uh, building which is on Monroe Avenue, which was also a co-op and a pottery and photography place as well. Um, they put on a lot of shows. I mean, there were a lot of shows. And I remember two things that I've never forgotten. One was Ramona doing Purple Rain when that was a popular song coming down the coming down the fireman's pole right into the room it was so dramatic <laughs> it was great she slid down the pole and what was the other there was something else that i remember that was funny there but susan clunkett also had her first restaurant in that building mm -hmm. so as i recall yeah. I forget what she called it jazzberry Jazzberries, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now wow. our colleague, our colleague Aaron Tobin told me about the top three seven. Uh, she <laughs> was with the Preservation League for many, many years and she's just moved on to a new position. But she said her aunt was uh, one of the top three seven. And I can't remember if she told me which one it was but i've got to send her <laughs> that picture and ask her if yeah it was one of the women in that picture which is really cool yeah wow. the action um of the top three seven actually occurred up near the reservoir right yeah that's and, what she explained um, to me yeah um the oh yeah i guess yeah <laughs> it was really um also around the time that some women's collective put out a calendar of um, images of women who were nude, but kind of hidden. Some had a towel over them, some um, that was to raise money for um, a women's political rally and function. But, like the calendar girls, you know, that's probably where they yeah, got the British the idea. Yeah. <laughs> but the top three <laughs> seven never wanted to make money off of that. They yeah. wanted the the right to be topless. And actually, we do have that right now, at least in New York, in, in New York State. Well, who's brave? Um, who's brave enough to use it? <laughs> and, uh, you know, Ramona hasn't stopped being the activist and and is very heavily involved with her basketball coaching and and all of that. But I'm sure um, yeah. you may remember Rochester Women Against Violence Against Women and two other actions that I mentioned on the tour. One was because of the objectification of women, they focused on 
pawn bookstores to do actions at. And what they would do is they would take some medicine beforehand, go into the pawn bookstore and regurgitate on the porn magazines <laughs> and thus making them oh my God. unusable, unsellable, and they would leave. Never heard that. That's great. They you were told us, never arrested. You told they us were that never at the other tour. <laughs> they, were, they were, you know, never, yeah. um, no charges were ever brought against them. Wow. So, um, I never heard that. They were very serious <laughs> about protecting women and having them treated with respect and dignity and not used as symbols of sex to attract merchandise to be bought. And I mention that specifically because um, downtown, I think on the corner of Clinton and South Avenue, near near where the inner inner loop goes around, there was a black velvet sign with um, a woman in um, a black low cut dress reaching out for a bottle of black velvet. Oh sure, and yeah. Oh, yeah. of course, I remember that. Almost ninety percent of the sign was the woman. 10% or so was the bottle. Of course. <laughs> and right. so the Rochester Women Against Violence Against Women at the time had some very excellent softball players. Uh -huh. And they filled eggs with paint. Paintball. And they threw them yeah. at the sign. Oh, wow. And Karen if said it I was recall, great. <laughs> the sign had to be replaced over the, a period of six years, three times. <laughs> <laughs> so they did not do it once. They did it again and again and again. No one was ever arrested. No one was ever charged. No one well, it was done in the dark of night. Who was <laughs> who was going to see them? But um, it really, you know, th their unwillingness to accept society's image of what a woman was and how they women can be used was totally unacceptable. And if you read the New Women's Times you will find article after article yeah. about women being proud and the objectification that they withstood because I'll take some they didn't that. have any choice in many cases. So, um, yeah, it's a very it's great, powerful great stories. Story. Thank you. When you look at it. And that's just a little bit. Right. Yep. True activism. Evelyn, yeah. you're amazing what you've dug up. Oh, my goodness. She's great. Yeah, yeah, she is. She's wonderful. A treasure. There's one other thing I remember that Karen Hagberg, who was with a woman named Martha Brown way back, and they were, they were always so generous opening up that house. There was a lot of stuff that happened there. I mean, a lot of occasions. And one of the sad ones was when we lost a couple of people in the community, one to a car accident, one to suicide. And I remember going to a um, really beautiful service for Jane Irwin, who was somebody I knew, who also wrote for the New Woman's Times at yeah. Karen's house. And um, I just wanted to, even though I don't think she's on, on this right now. She, Many women. It was wonderful. Wrote Many women wrote for the New Women's Times. As yep. a matter of fact, um, Duke University about, hmm, it must be 15, 20 years ago now, when the New Women's Times ended, it ran, it was a newspaper for approximately 10 or 11 years. The final disposition of that was to give 
legal rights to Maria Scipione to protect and take care of the copyright and the articles written in the New Women's Times. Duke, I believe it was Duke University, got in touch with me. They wanted to digitize the New Women's Times. And so I got in touch with Maria and she wrote a letter giving them permission to digitize the New Women's Times. It is now available on Reveal, which is a, um, which is a website that has digital um, copies of many, many, many other magazines. And um, so you can access that online and they have every issue. Wow, I every didn't know issue that. That was Bad ever man. printed. Yeah. Um, amazing, amazing women who really not only took the bill by the horns and did something about gay liberation, but did something about the way they wanted to be treated and to be looked at in society. And they didn't let that go for one minute. They worked until it happened. And now you, you know, you have Early in 2000, early in the late 1990s, women could wear pants and their dress changed, you know. Um, and then you have the, the coming to visibility of the transgender community and all that that entails in terms of being women visible. Um, it, it's amazing. There, there was I asked Karen at one point, and I asked RJ, because RJ comes to Rochester, and Larry Fine, when we did the documentary, I said, did you ever in your wildest dreams think that what you began in 1970 would have grown into this kind of activism and this kind of um, response to discrimination, inequality, the whole nine yards. No, the answer was <laughs> absolutely not. And if you look at some of the videotapes that were done in preparation for the documentary, you hear clearly we had the need to be who we were. That's what catapulted us into a life of activism. We couldn't deny being gay any longer. And after Stonewall, of course, there were over 400 gay liberation yeah. fronts around the country that grew up primarily in college campuses and universities. But the time was right. The, the, mm -hmm. the fire was lit and it, it went. It and it not, did not just stay in 1969 and the 70s and the 80s. That same fire in the belly is present in any woman who's involved in any way in cultural, political, social, or economic activity to make life better for women and therefore for the human race and society. So, um, <laughs> and here in Rochester, training as a teacher. Rochester, New York, you know, um, it's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. Yeah. Well, we thank you all for being here. Of course, we thank Evelyn, but it's really great to hear some of your stories. And we I hope I get to meet you, Larry. You seem uh, like a great guy. <laughs> well, thanks. Thanks. If you if you come back to Rochester. Oh, yeah. 
we'll I be do. here at uh, at our home at Warner Castle in uh, Highland Park, the Landmark Society. So I'd love to. Oh, you're with the Landmark Society? Right. Oh, okay. Oh, cool. I didn't know yeah. that. I've got it. Yeah, uh -huh. I know. Right. Yeah. Great. I know you okay. do wonderful Thank things, so too. It was really great. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you all. Yeah. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Okay. We'll let you know Bye, when we have another coming you. up. Good night. <laughs> Bye -bye. Alan, good job. And Larry, good, great job. And Thank you. Ryan. Thank you. And okay. Ryan, great job. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Yeah. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>